Bible, the word is terrible. Isn't that strange, you know? Awesome, terrible. That I, I was looking at a thing this morning. It was about oxymorons. And, you know, think about awesome and terrible. They, that seems to be an oxymoron in our, our modern English. But yet, you know, Scripture says God is terrible. God is awesome, you know. And uh, so, you know, some people I, I, I've known, I said, How, how's it going? Oh, it's awesome. I mean, are you God? <laughs> no, only God is awesome. But anyway, that has nothing to do with the message. I just threw that out there. So, good to be with you this morning. Trust the Lord is blessing your lives. Is he blessing your lives today? Yeah. Amen. Good. Well, you know, every once in a while, we need to be reminded of some uh, simple truths of Scripture. And basically, that's kind of what I want to do this morning is give you some simple truths, things that I'm sure you've heard before and you've studied before. And uh, perhaps you even heard this message from uh, somebody else. They copied it from me. No, not really. But, uh, you know, uh, it, it's one that's been around for a while. And uh, I just made it up myself the, the way to, to make it uh, to be able to preach it from my st standpoint. How many times have you sung this little chorus? God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. You sung that chorus here? Yeah, I'll bet you've sung it here before, you know. How many believe that? God can do anything but fail. It's true. God God will never fail. How are, or how about the chorus, nothing is impossible with God? Great chorus, isn't it? And indeed, nothing is impossible with God. God can do anything Anywhere, anytime that he wants to do. And, you know, those are great little choruses, but actually they don't tell the whole story. There are five things that God cannot do. And those are what I want to share with you this morning. What are those five things that God cannot do? Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of Titus, chapter uh, 1. Titus, chapter 1. And once you get to Titus, hold your finger there and find the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. Titus 1, Hebrews 6. All right. Pretty much found it. All right. Let me read the first two verses of Titus chapter 1 to you. Paul, the servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 6. Notice verses 17 and 18 with me. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his... Don't you like that word immutability? It's one of those words you use every day. You know, who knows what it means, immutability? It's a good theological, good doctrinal word. Anybody know what it means? unchangeable. God never changes. He is immutable. Well, let's re read the rest of it now that I interrupted that. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. His counsel never ever changes. Confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Father, as we begin this message this morning, Lord, uh, a number of different reminders that you have for us through scripture about living for you and realizing things that you do do, but things that you will not do. And Father, we just ask that you bless our hearts and minds as we study your word together. Help us to grow in your grace. Draw us close to you. 
And Father, perhaps there might be someone here today that has never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Draw that one unto yourself today. Help them to know the love of God through the forgiveness of sin in their lives as they accept Christ as their Savior. Lord, we just thank you for what you do. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, what's the first thing that we're going to look at? First of all, God cannot lie. We just read it in these two passages. He cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. It is He is immutable. Well, why is this? Let me uh, turn your attention to several scriptures. I'll, I'll, I'll share them with you. Why? First of all, because God is truth. If he's absolute truth, how can he lie? Just doesn't make sense, does it? John chapter 14, verse 6. You all know that verse, don't you? God says, I am the way, the what? Truth. truth and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. He is the truth. But then it also says in John 17, 17, he says, thy word is what? Truth. Thy word is truth. And back in John chapter 1, verse 1, God says that Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word. And uh, as such, in, in John chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus, who is the word, the truth, dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, his glory, which is full of grace and, guess what? Truth. God is truth, and we're to follow that truth. God does not lie about giving us liberty. He gives us freedom. He gives us freedom from the bondage of sin. The truth sets us free, according to John chapter 8. It does so because the Bible says that when we get saved, we receive, guess what? The spirit of, guess what the next word is? The spirit of truth. We receive the spirit of truth. You know, when you got saved, you understood that Jesus Christ came to live within you. He gave you a new life. He made you a new person in Christ. A new, brand new creature, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians. And as such, we, we have Christ living us, the hope of glory, as Titus writes. But then we, we also receive the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God. And sometimes, you know, when we think about our salvation and, and who we receive, in fact, the book of Colossians says we receive the Godhead bodily, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And we kind of let it go at that. But who is the Holy Spirit? Well, one of his names is, he is the Spirit of truth. He is the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth lives within us. John chapter 14, verse 17. So, the Spirit of truth who lives within us has three important duties as he lives within us. The blessed Holy Spirit will teach us all things. Now, if you're looking for an engineering degree, he's not going to give that to you. But the spirit of truth, who guides us into all scripture, we'll get to that in a moment, but the one who, who guides us into all truth is the one that can give us wisdom as well. So that perhaps if we might be studying or, or headed for, a, for an engineering degree, Lord, I need wisdom to understand these different things, these different operations, these different formulas that will help me in my engineering career. Whether it's engineering, whether it's a, a medical degree, whether it's a, a teaching degree, whatever it may be, God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth can give you the wisdom you need to help you through to understand what you need to know. The blessed Holy Spirit will teach us all things. He will teach us why certain things are wrong for the believer. And he'll teach us the consequences as well as teaching us about the rewards of following the truth of the word of God. And secondly, the spirit of truth, another duty that he has is the blessed Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. John chapter 16 verse 13. He'll show us better things things to do. 
Ever get that feeling once in a while, you know, I'd really like to do this, and then you get thinking about, no, I really shouldn't do that, you know? It may be right, it may be sinful, you know, whatever it may be. We need to go back and think, God, guide me. Show me what you want me to do. Show me where you want me to go. Help me to do what pleases you. So the blessed Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth as well. That's one of his duties as he lives within us. Third third thing that is part of his work as, as, as in, in us is this. It is the blessed Holy Spirit of truth that protects us from the spirit of error as well. I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 4 with me. 1 John chapter 4 verse 6. We'll probably do a lot of page flipping. So, you know, if you're one that has to wet your fingers every once in a while and get your pages wet, you know, go ahead. 1 John chapter 4. And turn, turn your attention to verse 6 with me. It says, and by the way, you know, 1 John is written to believers. So it's written to us. And here's the message to us. 1 John 4 verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So, we're reading through scripture. And we're getting, a hand, we're getting a handle on how to live for Christ. We're getting a handle on knowing the, the biblical doctrines of the Word of God. We're understanding what's right, what's wrong, according to what God says. And so we have it here in our minds. We have it down here in our hearts. And all of a sudden, somebody comes along and says, you know, Christ was only a prophet. Christ was only a prophet. He was a good man, did a lot of good things. Is that true? Absolutely. But then they say, but God was not God, but Jesus was not God. Oh, problem. You know what? The red flag ought to go right up, shouldn't it? If you have a handle on the Word of God, and if you're allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your life, immediately the Spirit of God says, whoa, stop there. There's a problem. Jesus Christ is God. He is deity. He is God in the flesh. And by the way, you ought to be able to defend that doctrinal truth with Scripture. And the Spirit of God will help to protect you. He'll protect me against the spirit of error. When God speaks, thus saith the Lord, there are always these they are always words of truth because God cannot lie. Let me move on to the second one here. God cannot allow sin in heaven. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 5 with me. Ephesians chapter 5. God cannot allow sin in heaven. You know, I noticed the, the height of this, this uh, pulpit. I noticed this little stand down here. And uh, it re immediately reminded me of my Bible school days. Our, our president we had there, uh, Dr. Rob, he was a little short guy. And that pulpit was tall. You know, if he didn't stand on that little stand, you know, it would be kind of like this, you know. So, well... Anyway, you know, I just saw that stand there. Does Pastor Mills really have to stand on that? No, I didn't think so. Anyway. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I thought Pastor Mills just wanted to be a little bit taller. <laughs> I better get on with this message. I'll never get done. Well, number two, God cannot allow sin into heaven. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. It says here, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now, if that wasn't quite enough, turn, turn back over to the book of Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. 
And there's going to be a whole list of things back here. Chapter 22, verses 14 and 15. Look at this list here. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs. By the way, when, when you see that term dogs in scripture, by and large it refers to those that are not Jewish people, those that are unbelievers, Gentiles, or are referred to as dogs. Ah, I better. <laughs> Sorry, I could, I could tell more stories, but I'm not going to. But without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. You see, God cannot allow sin in heaven. And here's a whole list of different sinners and sins that they commit. If you remember, it was sin that spoiled the Garden of Eden. It was through the pride of Lucifer. It was the lust of Eve. It was the disobedience of Adam. And because of that sin that came into the garden, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. And because of the sin of, of Lucifer, he and a third of the holy angels became demonic angels and were kicked out of heaven, will be kicked out of heaven particularly. It was sin that brought a divine curse on all of nature in Genesis chapter 3. It was sin that separated man from God and his fellowship. Anybody remember Isaiah chapter 59? Take, take a look at Isaiah chapter 59 with me. Over here. God is very distinct. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. There's a verse that we taught our kids when they were very young, Psalm 66, 18. It says this, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I tell you what, they learned that verse early, and they knew it well. And any time that they did something that they knew that they weren't supposed to do, we'd, we'd take them aside, you know what you just did? I said, yeah, I, I teased Naomi the wrong way and made her cry. However, they did it. And, um, you know, we take them aside and said, now, what is that? It's sin. What what was that verse that you learned in Psalm 66, verse 18? And they hang their head down low, Rachel or Dan. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So, so Rachel, if you prayed right now, is God going to hear you? No. And we deal with the whole issue. And she'd end up, or he'd end up, if it was Dan, confessing their sin because they realized that before God could hear their prayer, they'd have to confess their sin and get it right. And so they would confess their sin and they'd get things right with God and, you know, they'd go on their merry way from there. But the fact of the matter is, is that our sin and the sin of other people will separate us from our fellowship with God. Now, if you're a born-again believer, your sin is not going to break your relationship. You know, when, when a child sins against their parent or against somebody else, it doesn't break their relationship as the son or daughter of mom and dad. They are still related. But that sin will break the fellowship. There's going to be hurt. There's a broken fellowship there. And that has to be repaired. And so we come to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we get it right. We confess, we get it right, and we go on with our fellowship with God. But our iniquities will separate us. 
And folks, the fact of the matter is, sin is not allowed in heaven. That's what we're trying to get through to her. It was sin that nailed Jesus to the cross for every human being. And it is sin that will never be allowed in God's wonderful, beautiful, glorious heaven. For the Christian, his sin has already been paid at Calvary. He's forgiven and given eternal life. The redeemed, the forgiven Christian will enter heaven clean and white in the robes of Christ's righteousness as you, as you read in Revelation chapter 19 verses 7 through 9. Only those who have been washed from their sins by the blood of the land will be able to enter into heaven. God cannot and he will not allow sin in heaven. God kicked Lucifer and a third of his angels, as we mentioned now already, out of heaven because of sin. Isaiah 14, verse 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst, uh, which didst weaken the nations? And in Revelation chapter 12, let's see. Oh, we're not there anymore. Let's go back to Revelation again. Revelation chapter 12, let me read verses 3 and 4. It says this, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. God cannot allow sin in heaven. Why? Because heaven is a place of no tears, no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. You know what causes all those things? Sin. Sin. It's sin that causes those things. Why can't sin be in heaven? Because heaven represents God who is without sin and is holy and righteous and true. Sin is against the character, against the attributes of God. He can't allow sin into heaven. Here's number three. God cannot help loving you. Aren't you glad? He can't help but loving you. To the Jews, God said, He chose them because He loved them. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 8 says, Know what God says to the Prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 3, tells us that he has an everlasting love. Now, let me ask you a question here, okay? We've got gals and guys here, so, so each of you can, you know, respond your own way. You, you don't have to tell me, you know, I don't want to embarrass you, but you know that first time, guys, let, let's pick on the guys, that first time, you know, maybe in grade school, in high school, you saw this pretty girl. Remember her? You know, I I remember, you know, up front, there was this gal named Gail. She was pretty. She was real pretty. She was the fire fire chief's daughter in our village. I said, man, it sure be nice to know her a little bit better. There there was this this other gal. She She's a little shorter gal. She... Little blonde Amy, she was cute. She was real cute. Wouldn't mind dancing with her at school dance. Never did, though. You know, had that first first impression. I said, wow, nice. And I know you gals, you know, you know, as, as my kids were growing up, you know, the term came out, if, if it was a good-looking guy, he's a hunk. I was never a hunk, <laughs> more of a chunk. <laughs> but you know, that kind of love is called a Philadelphia love. It's an, a love that you have an admiration for somebody. But God's love is not that way. It's not simply an affectionate love. It is called agape. It is a sacrificial love. 
And when God says, I love you, it says, I will do anything because I love you. I will lay my life down. And the scripture says in the Gospel of John, no greater love is this than a man lay down his life for his friends. And the Lord Jesus laid down his life for us. Not because he had an affectionate love, but because he had a sacrificial love for us. He can't help but love us. He knows our old man. He knows our new man when we got saved. He knows the pit of sin that we are in. And you know, it, it doesn't matter how deep down in that, that pit that we were, we're in. In fact, you know, the psalmist writes that we were down into the miry clay. Do you realize what that pit really is? That pit was a, a pit that was set up for animals to get caught in. It would be covered over and, you know, an animal that would become a predator to, to the sheep or to the other animals that the goats that the, that the uh, herdsmen, the shepherds were taking care of. They'd set this trap up to try to catch the, the predator, the lion, the tiger, the wolf, whatever it may be. And they'd come in and they'd slip down into this pit. And it was filled with miry clay. What does miry clay mean? It means that it's that type of clay that once you get into it, it just keeps sucking you down in deeper and deeper and deeper. Kind of like quicksand until finally it kills the animal. Let me tell you something. Before we were saved, we were in that miry pit. And we were sinking deeper and deeper. Why? Because we were sinners before a holy God. And that sin just produced spiritual death in us. And we were dying more and more every day as we were sinking deeper and deeper into that miry pit. Well, aren't you glad that the next verse after that one in Psalm 40 says, But God reached down into that pit pulled us up out of that pit. And this verse says, he sets us upon a rock. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and that rock is the Lord Jesus. He loved us that much that he took us out of that pit and set us upon the rock, the Lord Jesus. He knows the price of our sin, which was death, but God's son took that price and his love gave us eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He cannot help loving us, though while still in our iniquity, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God commendeth. And that, that word commendeth means God demonstrated. God showed us. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He can't help loving us, because we are made in God's image, because of God's eternal plan to show his love in the greatest way possible. There is no other way, no greater way, that love can be shown than that Jesus Christ died for us. He can't help loving us, because of God's attributes of grace and mercy. You know, sometimes we don't always think about these two terms completely right. When we think about God's grace, that's God's undeserved favor to us. He didn't have to give us Jesus, but he did. But then we have to think about mercy as well. That's God holding back the judgment that should have been poured upon us, that we should have received. But God says, I'll show you my grace, my undeserved favor, and I'll show you my mercy, holding back the judgment that we deserve. Isn't it interesting that as Paul writes his different epistles, he begins them and quite often ends them by the grace and mercy of God to the Romans, to the Colossians, to the Ephesians, and so forth. And he ends that in his salutation as he closes the letters as well. No, may God bless you with his grace and mercy. God cannot help loving us. And as his children, 
We cannot be separated from that love, according to Romans chapter 8. Let me give you number four here. Number four, God cannot let sin go unpunished either. Go to the book of Ezekiel with me. Now, we were there this morning. I'm not going to take you to the same passage, but turn to the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 with me. Chapter 18, the book of Ezekiel. Look at verse 4 with me. Ezekiel chapter 4 it says, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. And here it is. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, that should be good enough for us, but, you know, God repeats it. Go over to verse 20. Here it says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. God's desire for us, according to Leviticus 11, and then Peter wrote it again in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. His desire for us is to be holy as God is holy. You see, sin is contrary to God's holiness. When we talk about holiness, we're talking to God, about a God who is completely free from any sin and cannot sin. And we are to be examples of him. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says that we are to be followers of Christ. If we're to be followers of Christ, that means we need to be holy as he is holy. And in the book of John, chapter 17, we're told that the Word of God sanctifies us. You know what that word sanctify is? It's the same word. It's the same Greek word as holy. We are set apart by God for God. And if we're set apart by God, it means that we're set apart to be holy like God is holy. So this, mo this morning as you walk out of this place, It'll probably be afternoon, but nonetheless, when you walk out of this place today, you can go out and say, I am a holy person, and rightfully say it, if you're living for Christ. Sin is contrary to God's holiness. Even the great prophet Isaiah knew his sinfulness in the presence of holy God. In Isaiah chapter five, or chapter 6, rather, verses 5 and 6, you know, it, that's a great passage. One of my favorite passages, in fact. And, you know, God takes Isaiah up in a vision. And God is able to see the glory of God. And is the moment that Isaiah sees that glory, he says, Woe is me! I am a man of unclean lips. And as soon as he admits that, as soon as he confesses that, Angel of God comes by with 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 uh, tongs and and a, a coal and, and he touches Isaiah to cleanse him from on un, any unholiness. Sins contrary to God's holiness and Isaiah recognizes. Listen, we need to recognize any unholiness that comes into our lives as well. Sin is contrary to God's new life as well. Go to the book of Colossians with me. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. When we get to Colossians chapter 3, let's look at verses 8 through 10. It says here, But now ye also put off all these. Anybody ever have a problem with anger? Yeah, you don't want to admit it, do you? I'll tell you what, it's pretty easy to get angry at times. It's easy. But God says, but now you also put off all these. And he starts out with anger. Then wrath. By the way, if you don't deal with anger, it, and it gets worse and worse, it becomes wrath. You see, anger is an emotion. Wrath is the active part of anger. That's striking out. Put off anger. Put off wrath, he says here. Malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. And now, let's get the, the part that we should be doing. Verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge 
after the image of him that created him. In other words, get to know who God is that lives within me. He's renewed me when I got saved. And I'm to follow in his image. He created me. You see, drop down to verses 12 and 13 now. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. I know when you think of bowels, you're thinking about your innards, aren't you? But that's not what it is. Bowels here means an overflowing of joy, is what it literally means. Put on this overflowing of joy, of mercies. You're joyful because of the mercies of God. Put on kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one. It's kind of hard to forbear some people, isn't it? I mean, some people just get on to you, don't they? Said, man, oh man, I can't stand that person. But God says, forbearing one another. And forgiving one another. Even... Uh, If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now I know that, you know, in, in some of these modern translations, they take out that word charity and you just simply put love in there. Love doesn't cut it, folks. You know, I can say I love you, but not be charitable. You see, charity is the right word here. And when you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that's the right word there. Charity does this, charity does this, charity doesn't do that, and so on, down through those verses in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Charity is love in action. God wants us to have a love that is in action. That's part of our new man. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, the bond of perfection, the bond of completion in Christ. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. How many of you sing sing the great songs of God? Aren't they terrific? You know, you know, uh, I, I like the old hymns. I, I really like the old hymns. I like some of the new choruses that are out. There are a lot of choruses I don't like because they're nothing but fluff. But there are a lot of good songs. How many songs, spiritual songs, do you have in your heart that you can whistle, that you can tune, that you can sing, that come to mind, you know, over certain situations in your life? You see... When we look at sin, sin is contrary to God's new life. And all these things that we read about here in Colossians are part of the new life. Sin is contrary to God's working of the Spirit. So you see, sin grieves the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. God dealt with sin universally in the garden. God dealt with sin universally in Noah's time. And God dealt with sin universally on Calvary once and for all. God deals with sin, though, not only universally, but individually as well. Concerning a believer, he purges unfruitfulness. In John chapter 15, we read about that. And he chastises for correction and maturity. He wants to work in our lives that we are the holy people of God that we need to be. God cannot let sin go unpunished. Last of all, God cannot forgive your sin if you don't receive his son in your life. We already read in Isaiah chapter 59 that our iniquities separate us from God. Man was separated from God by sin in the garden. Receiving Christ brings relationship with God. In John chapter 3 verse 18, we're told there that man is condemned by God for unbelief. Believing on Christ removes that condemnation, Romans chapter 8 verse 1. I want you to listen to John chapter 1 verse 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he life. 
to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Galatians 3.13 tells us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse. You see, before we were saved, we were cursed. Cursed with sin. Cursed in the bondage of sin. Cursed to an everlasting condemnation without Christ. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse. We simply need to receive Christ as our Savior. Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 says that Christ has redeemed us to God by his word. Paul wrote it this way. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The only way to be saved is by listening to the word of God that tells us that Jesus died for us. That he paid the price for our sin. That he went to that cruel cross, shed his blood to pay for that sin that we are guilty of. And as he died on that cross, and he finally said, it is finished. The work of salvation was complete for man. Now, all man had to do was come to the point of looking up and saying, Jesus, you died for my sin. I am a sinner before you. And I thank you, you took my place. And I accept you into my life. And I ask you, and I believe you with all my heart, that you died for me, and you were buried, and you rose again for me. I believe that, and I accept you as my Savior. You see, when that happens, God gives complete forgiveness of all your sin. And he gives you complete eternal life. He gives you eternal life. He makes you a new person in Christ. He makes you his child. If you've never received Christ before, would you receive him today? And how about that new life in Christ? If you're saved, are you living it for his glory? Are you being holy as he is holy? God will do anything but fail as long as it is in his glorious, holy character. Let's pray. Lord God, we count it a privilege today to be able to open your word and to look at these simple truths. Lord, they're simple, but they're so meaningful as well. Lord, we realize that you cannot lie. Your word is truth, and we believe it with all our hearts. We realize, Father, too, that Sin is a a real problem and you can't handle it and you won't handle it. It will not be able to be in heaven whatsoever. Father, we thank you too that you can't help but love us and you loved us so much that you gave us your son, the Lord Jesus, to be our savior. Father, we realize too that if we're born again, we need to be holy as you are holy. But Father, the greatest challenge of all is that each and every person be saved. Your word tells us that you are not willing that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. Father, you know each and every person here in this room this morning. You know whether they're saved, whether they're not saved. You know if they're saved, whether they're living for you or not living for you. And Father... It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that you can work in each life this morning. And Father, I pray that you would do that. If there's someone here that has never trusted Christ, may they come to the point and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe that I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. Please forgive me and please be my Savior. Father, if there's that type of person here this morning, help them to pray that right now and get saved. Become a child of God. Father, if there's somebody here today that's already prayed that, they know that they're saved, they know that they're on their way to heaven, and yet, Father, they're stumbling over some kind of sin in their life, help them to bow before you and say, Lord, you died for that sin that I'm guilty of right now, and I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me, and I'm asking you, Lord, to fill me with your spirit, I'm asking you, Lord, to help me to walk in holiness as you want me to be holy. 
Lord God, work in each of our hearts. Draw us close to you. We love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here and you need to make decisions in your life to be saved, please come to the altar or make that decision even right where you're at. If there's sin in your life that you need to confess, some something in your life that you need to get right with God, deal with it today that you might know the joy of Christ in your life. Brother?